Hello and welcome to the demonstration video for the Laser Modes Lab. We'll be making some observations about how gas lasers work and some of their specific properties. Some of your questions relate to the laser in a box, which is this clear plastic box. The wiring inside is quite simple. Connecting an input voltage through a switch to a power supply produces about a thousand volts, although at very low current. As we apply increasing voltage to the laser in a box, its behavior changes. First we see occasional faint flickers of light, increasing in intensity and frequency with more voltage. Finally, around the time we get to six, six and a half volts, the laser stabilizes. And from then on, more voltage just increases the brightness. Just a little bit more detail on this um, open laser. The middle part from here to here, that's this part, that's the gas tube. Um, and so you can maybe see that there's a slender glass inset inside of there. And so the voltage is being applied between this end and this end, uh, creating the plasma inside the little thin stream of plasma. So that's it's probably pretty thick glass and that's why the stream of plasma looks so thin compared to the diameter of the glass. Um, that tube is has got it's a partial vacuum so it's relatively low pressure gas inside of there that makes it easier to create the cascade that's necessary to create that plasma. If you think about from physics 120, uh, 106, um, how lightning is created through a cascade of pulling one electron off of an atom, that electron accelerates one way, the remaining positive ion accelerates the opposite way, they smash into other atoms that are already under electrical stress because they're in the strong electric field, and those atoms get ionized and their electrons and ions start accelerating. So you get a cascade reaction. That cascade reaction gets quenched if there are too many atoms that are, um, that are in the way. So it basically, if you can lower the pressure, it gives you more distance for the electron and the ion to accelerate before they hit something so they can gain more energy and maintain that cascade reaction. So it's low pressure gas inside that tube. That is separate from the mirrors. So there's little tiny mirrors on the end. So I don't know if you can quite see it. There, that shiny round thing that, that looks blue in this view. That's the mirror on this end. And then, um, let me move this so we can see a little better. Hmm. The thing that you can see the red dot on right there, that's the mirror on this end. So those mirrors are separate from the tube, but they're carefully aligned to be perpendicular to one another. I'm going to set up um, this card to catch the beam, and I'm going to have that be pretty close to the, the laser tube. And we put um, black tape on the end of this to just shield out as much of the, the excess light as we can. Um, and over here I've got the, this is the neon source, this one, and there is the helium source. And I've got everything as close together as I can to make it easier to compare the spectra. So let's turn on the sources. So there's the neon. You can see that it sort of has the classic orange color looks more orange to my eye than it does here in the video but it's still pretty orange of like a neon sign and then turn on helium that's more of a a whitish output with a little bit of a purple tone to it and i've got them set up so that they're on the same horizontal level we're going to look through this which is a diffraction grating. So let me turn off the lights and close the door. Let's see what kind of a view we can get. I'll try to put this in front of the camera. There we go. Okay. So 
Again, going from left to right, we have this light coming out the side of the laser, the red laser dot hitting the card, the helium discharge tube, and the neon discharge tube. If we look up, we can see the first order diffraction pattern coming from all those. If I keep on looking up, there's the second order diffraction pattern. And then there's the M equals zero, meaning just the regular light. And if we look down, there's M equals minus one and M equals minus two. So let's see if I can get, get the clearest possible image. It might actually be easier to look at the M equals minus two. So notice when you go from M equals minus one to M equals minus two, things are more spread out, which allows you to compare things more equally. So again, on the left is the side light from the laser. Then going from there, you can see the little red dot, which is the diffraction pattern of the red dot on the card. And then the helium and then the neon. So I'll give you a second to look at this. I think you may be asked to comment on the degree to which the light coming out of the laser is polarized, so uh, let's experiment using this polarizer. So first, to determine the transmission axis of the polarizer, we look at the light that's reflected from the overhead lights in the room. So as it reflects off of the floor, it's primarily polarized horizontally. So mostly the electric field is oscillating back and forth like this. So if I look through this polarizer and rotate it, you can see at about this angle, it's completely blocking the light. So that means that the transmission axis is now vertical. If you look at the, the markings on it, you would think that it should be at zero, that it's vertical, but in fact, it's it's a little bit mismarked, so the transmission axis is a little bit counterclockwise from, or the transmission axis being vertical is a little bit counterclockwise from that. Anyway, so let's take, use this and take a look at the light that's coming from our laser. And on the right, you can see the, so on the left, you can see the side light coming out from the laser tube. On the right, you can see the laser dot being, the laser just being projected onto this card. So let's look at them through the polarizer. I'm going to rotate the polarizer as best I can, holding it by hand. And basically, we're not seeing any change in the intensity of that light. So what does that tell you about the polarization state? of the laser light. For the next part of the experiment, we're going to need a bigger laser. And this one is a class 3B helium neon laser with a laser cavity about 60 centimeters long. It has enough power to cause retinal damage faster than you can blink uh, if the beam enters your eye directly or is a specular reflection from a shiny surface. So we'll be wearing goggles at all times while the laser is active. Okay, let's look at this first with the room lights on. Uh, and then Paul is going to show you what it looks like with the room lights off. So we have this relatively long laser here. The beam is bouncing off of this mirror. So the beam is traveling, you can see it on my finger, traveling along, hitting this mirror, then hitting this mirror, bounces off of this mirror. It goes through, what is this? I think this is just a hole. So yeah, it's just an aperture, probably um, that's used as part of the alignment. So I can sort of damp that down and I can see that it's, it looks a little off center actually in this aperture here, but the final thing is going pretty much where we want it. This is uh, sort of a one-way valve for light and Paul is gonna talk about that more later. And then the laser goes through a lens and then finally into this unit, which is the Fabry Perot. And you can see that the beam is pretty well centered on that Fabry Perot, even though it's not correctly centered on this aperture. So it all looks, looks pretty good. I'm just gonna give you a side view. There's the Fabry Perot. There's my, my hand for comparison. Um, let's get a ruler so you can see. 
see if you wanted to. There's a quantitative scale for comparison. So the mirrors in this are probably you know roughly here and here. On the way to the spectrometer, we send the laser through an optical isolator that only allows light to flow one way. You might want to think for a second about why we would need an optical isolator in this system. Inside this Fabry Perot spectrometer, we see a cavity with curved mirrors at both ends. Uh, some of the beam bounces back along the incoming path, which answers the question, why do we need an optical isolator? We don't want the beam to bounce all the way back to the laser and damage it. Um, there are um, there's a power wire attached and a signal wire. The signal wire is going to the back of this unit. And this unit has got two parts in it, as you can tell from the labels here. There is a function generator, which is generating a sawtooth ramp. So we're using, you can do a few different functions, but we're using the sawtooth. And that's going to be applied to the piezo element in the fabric furrow. So that's going to cause the mirrors to get, let's say if we're starting here on the sawtooth, the mirrors are starting at their closest point. They're getting gradually further and further apart as that sawtooth increases and then jumping back together as we go down here. And so as the distance between the mirrors is changing, the condition for constructive interference inside the Fabry Perot is changing to a different, rate, different wavelengths. And so when, and there's a photodiode at the back here, which is measuring the intensity of the light that gets through this. So only the constructively interfered light gets through, registers on the photodiode, and comes into this unit. The other half of the unit, as marked schematically here, is a signal amplifier. It's amplifying that signal from the photodiode. The unit has three different outputs. The main one is on the back, and you can see it's labeled here, the photodiode signal is coming out this coax. And so that's the amplified photodiode signal in the simulator. You can hook that up to whichever oscilloscope channel you want to. And then on the front, there are two other signals. This one here, which is labeled output, that's the sawtooth wave that's being applied to the piezo. And then there's another one called trigger, which is synchronized with the sawtooth wave. So the trigger would be this square wave here. So each time we have a downward transition of the sawtooth, we have an upward transition on the trigger output. And so you can make use of those, those signals uh, as you see fit. The only control that we give you in the simulator is this DC offset. And what that does is to add a DC level to this sawtooth, shifting the entire sawtooth up or down. And so if you think about the effect on the piezos, that's going to kind of shift the starting point from maybe, I'm greatly exaggerating the range with my fingers from when I shift it up, the starting point might be here. And so then as we do the sawtooth ramp, it goes zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz